Malcolm became uh, one of the lowest forms of human beings you could become, according to his own testimony in his autobiography. Before he reached his 21st birthday, he was locked up. Our fathers weren't the pilgrims. We didn't land on Plymouth Rock. The rock was landed on us. We're talking about a guy who uh, began his adult life as a hustler doing every kind of drug available in the streets of um, actually from a to fight himself through a religious conversion. When they are being brutally and unjustly attacked, then the Negroes themselves should take whatever steps necessary to defend themselves. When he spoke, he struck home to the crux of the matter. He'd hit you with the truth, just like someone would hit you in the head with a blunt instrument and butt your head open. We must have separation in order to be equal. We must have separation in order to have freedom. We must have separation in order to have justice. What is your real name? Malcolm, Malcolm X. Uh, is that your legal name? As far as I'm concerned, it's my legal name. Would you mind telling me what your father's last name was? My father didn't know his last name. The last name of my forefathers yeah. was taken from them when they were brought to America and made slaves. And then the name of the slave master was given, which we refuse. We reject that name today. You mean, you, mean to you won't even tell me what your father's supposed last name was or gifted last name was? I never acknowledge it whatsoever. Although he did not acknowledge his given name in later life, he was born Malcolm Little on May 19, 1925 in Omaha, Nebraska. He was the fourth child of Louise and Earl Little. Earl was from Georgia, Louise from Grenada. Earl, a Baptist minister, worked in construction to feed his growing family. Malcolm's childhood was heavily influenced by his parents' involvement in Marcus Garvey's black separatist movement. Garvey preached that to survive, blacks must form their own nation outside and separate from whites. The Garvey movement largely represented blacks who were not professionals, not largely lawyers and doctors, at least they were not prominent so much. They certainly reached down to get the masses of black people who were not in the mainstream largely of the African-American community. The Ku Klux Klan was then powerful in the North. In Omaha, the Klan threatened the Littles before Malcolm was born because they were Garvey organizers. Rather than fight, Earl moved his family in years first to Milwaukee, then Indiana, settling in Lansing, Michigan in 1928. By then, Earl and Louise had four boys and Earl. Despite the dangers, Earl continued his work as a Garveyite. He didn't have a permanent church, but he was a preacher. So he traveled the place promoting Marcus Garvey movement, the separatist movement, and at the same time trying to preach the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He saw no conflicts between the two. Now, Malcolm used to travel with his father as he would talk about Garvey and talk in churches about Jesus Christ. Malcolm learned to love to talk about Garvey but he didn't like so much the talk about Jesus Christ. Settling in the industrialized Midwest was a good idea at the time because Earl could find where he and Louise had their hands full caring for their growing family. Malcolm's rivalry with his brothers was contentious at times as they competed for their parents' attention. Life was not easy for Malcolm and his family, but his father's hard work and preaching put enough food on the table. Then the depression in every In Lansing, Detroit, uh, Grand Rapids, places like that, the, the loss of jobs for African Americans was devastating. Chances are, if you were black, you were poor. In 1929, their family went to the ground. Malcolm's father believed the Ku Klux Klan was responsible, but there was no proof. Earl Little built a new house, a tar paper shack with no running water, no indoor. 
Earl gave each child daily chores, some in the garden, some in the house. He was a tough father, beating his children if they didn't follow his rules. Malcolm's mother and father uh, were violent in their relationship to each other. Malcolm talks about his father, you know, expressing the frustrations that he experienced in society in the context of the family. And that created a great deal of tension within the family. In fact, Malcolm claims that uh, it was from the fight between his mother and his father that led his father to leave that day he was killed. In 1931, when Malcolm was six, Earl Little died. He fell or was pushed off a streetcar in the night. His left arm was crushed and his left leg partially severed by the rear wheels. Although officials said the death was accidental, Malcolm was killed by Ku Klux Klan because news. But Malcolm never talked publicly about his father's death. This particular experience left the family destitute. And so Malcolm grew up in a very uh, difficult situation in which he had very little reinforcement for his self-esteem in the environment in which he lived. In the 1930s, none of the seven children had enough to eat. Stale bread, wild onions, and dandelion leaves were often the only food. At school, Malcolm ate alone, rarely joining the other kids for lunch. For Malcolm, going to a predominantly white school, for example, uh, feeling uh, alienated from the dominant culture, uh, feeling as if he really had very few friends and his white friends pretty much shunned him, uh, that could have deep psychological effects uh, on, on Malcolm. He was tall, handsome, red-haired, light-skinned, Skinned, different even within his family. Much of the color symbolism was reflected in the context of that family. Malcolm's mother uh, was very, very light complexion. And so she, uh, Malcolm's father, was a very dark complexion man. So uh, the children were mixed. Some were dark, some were light. Malcolm was a light red, very much like his mother in color. So his mother was hard on him. She wanted Malcolm to get in the sun and put some black on him. Malcolm became a troublesome child after his father's death. His mother found it hard to supervise her family alone. Though Malcolm was a good student, he became a disciplinary problem, and he was moved from school to school. But despite all that, in the seventh grade, he was voted class president. Years later, Malcolm realized this was his first experience with tokenism. Being the only African-American or one of a few also makes you an exotic. He did get a lot of attention uh, and people noticed him wherever he went. Um, it was also, it's also an unusual situation to be uh, not only young, black, uh, poor, in a predominantly white community, but to be as, as intelligent and as articulate as he was. Uh, which made him, in some respects, an automatic leader, even among his peers. Because his teachers found him so hard to handle, in the eighth grade, Malcolm was placed in a white foster home in Mason, Michigan. The authorities thought new surroundings would calm him. Soon he was first in it, but his desire to achieve, to be somebody, quickly faded. In fact, when he was in the eighth grade, the incident that forced him to out of school, embarrassed him, made him feel like he was not important, was when his teacher asked him what he wanted to be when he would grow up. And he said he wanted to be a lawyer, an attorney. And his teacher uh, said to him, Malcolm, you have to be a little more realistic than that. Because you can't be that and a nigger at the same time. Being a lawyer is no realistic expectation for a nigger, he said. He became disheartened and quit school. Malcolm was 14. It was the World War II. Though the Depression was ending, life was still hard in America, especially for blacks. Malcolm's mother, Louise, was pregnant with eighth child. The father was unknown. 
she was increasingly losing touch with reality. After her son was born, she was found wandering in the cold of winter, her feet bare, her baby boy held tightly in her arms. Louise was declared legally insane and committed to Kalamazoo State Hospital. Malcolm now had neither mother nor father to guide him. He could not be just like the white children and thus being shown in many ways that he could not be accepted just like anybody else. And this tension grew in Malcolm so much so that he dropped out of the dominant society. School had no meaning for Malcolm. Teachers could not plan him. He sometimes stole. But something new was on the horizon. Sister Ella, a daughter from Earl Little's first marriage, came from Boston to visit the family. Turned home, she asked Malcolm to stay with her over the summer. She knew her half-brother was having a difficult time and took it on herself to save him. But Boston opened Malcolm's eyes. Boston was the big city, and he was treated by his peers immediately as a kind of country bumpkin, backwards, uh, young, um, and one way to escape that country was to enter a kind of cool subculture, in this case, of the suit, of the hipster, a kind of underground, predominantly male youth culture that was raised in the late 30s and early 40s. After the summer, Malcolm returned to Lansing, where his family was still struggling to survive. He felt isolated and sent Ella a letter saying he wanted to live in Boston. She told him he was welcome. By February 1941, he was back in a city that would change his life forever. After the death of his father, his mother's confinement in an insane asylum and his increasing loneliness as one of the few blacks in East Lansing, 15-year-old Malcolm was anxious to return to the predominantly black Roxbury section of Boston. Once there, he gave his sister Ella more problems than she could handle. She literally went around the streets looking for him. You know, uh, cause you know, he came to Boston, you know, like he was a country boy. And he of course had to do a lot of ducking and dodging because there were a lot of relatives who lived in Boston at that time. And he just, you know, just became completely dazzled by everything and wanted to get out there. <laughs> to be like the black called the ballroom hall he wanted to be like the blacks who were not ashamed of who they were and who lived in the underworld and he became a part of it when you go to a place like the rosen ballroom for example they were packed full of young people men dressed in suit suits uh young women who sort of identified with their culture Malcolm bought a colorful zoot suit. Then he took the painful, fashionable step of conking his hair, straightening it using lye, raw potatoes, and eggs. He was starting a new life. Though Ella wanted him to be a lawyer, to go into business, Malcolm's thoughts were elsewhere. After years as an outsider, Malcolm had finally found a place where he belonged. They embraced him because when he was articulate, they embraced, embraced him because he um, ended up being a, a very good dancer. Uh, he was stylish. He would put on a suit of clothes and look like a changed person, a brand new person, and step out of his background and into kind of uh, a, a whole new world. Part of that world was the inner sanctum of the pool hall, the hangout of hustlers, hipsters, budding crooks, time criminals. I used to play pool in this pool room every day. And Malcolm had a reputation in Roxbury at that time of being one of the best dressed men in town with the, the famous zoot suit. And uh, he was standing on the sidelines to watch fellas shoot pool. One day in the pool hall, Shorty Jarrett made a great shot and the excitement lost his watch. And I looked at Malcolm and I said, you didn't see it, did you? because he was a newcomer. He had a smirk on his face. And I walked up to him quick with my hands in those days, grabbed him and I drew back to hit him. And when I did, somebody grabbed my arm and said to me, no, he didn't take your watch. Somebody else got your watch and they're gone. 
Now I was in the process of apologization. Man, I'm sorry. Uh, I falsely accused you and so on and so on. That was the beginning of our friendship. Despite the fancy clothes, to survive, Malcolm had to take what he called slave jobs, menial work open to blacks. He was a king porter on the New Haven Railroad, bussed tables, swept floors. Because the big entertainers of the day, Malcolm shot shoes. Bob's gay to eat, leaving him time to develop his skills as a petty criminal. Malcolm was, in my opinion, a beautiful con artist. He was a thinker. And he learned these things from street smarts, I call it. From living on the streets and being around people in the hustling world. He could meet you on the street, as I've told it many times, and be broke. And talk you out of your last two dollars. And you'd give it to him with enthusiasm. Working on the railroad allowed Malcolm to travel freely and often between Boston and Harlem, New York. Now, Harlem was the capital of not just the hipster culture, the capital of the black world. And so going to Harlem for Malcolm was uh, like going to Harlem for a lot of African Americans. It was entering the most exciting place you can possibly be. Malcolm, already part of Boston subculture, became part of Harlem's thriving underground economy. He moved into pimping, steering white men to black prostitutes. During World War II, Malcolm was a petty he stick on it, ran numbers, sold marijuana. He frequented jazz club, was a small time pusher, and used every drug he could find. Clubs where jazz was performed were places of exchange for others uh, and users. And so the whole world that surrounded Malcolm was also one infested with drugs. And so it was hard for him to escape that possibility. In spite of the lure of Harlem, Malcolm always returned to Boston, to Roxbury, where he was admired for his flashy clothes and his charismatic personality. It was like a Romeo, and I say that, the girls were all after him. He was the type of person that when he walked down the street, he would command a chin. With that blood red hair he had and with that zoot suit on, the girls were all in love with him. During Christmas 1940, 45, Malcolm, in constant need of new thrills, on a strawberry came three white women, one of whom was Malcolm's girlfriend. We were out stealing for two weeks for a fun kid. Somebody in the gang said, oh, let's go out and break in somebody's house for fun. Being adventurous as young people like to be. We certainly wasn't doing it for money. We were making our own livelihoods and our own rights. So for fun for two weeks, and after two weeks, we stopped. Malcolm was eventually arrested when he attempted to buy back a watch he had pawned. The gang was caught, indicted, and tried in early 1946. Malcolm and Shorty could not make bail and were kept in a cage inside the courtroom. Jarvis said the detectives and prosecution were furious that white girls were socializing with men. They tried to get the girls to say that we had raped them. The girls wouldn't hear that because they knew better. They sentenced the girls to five years uh, in a reformatory and gave them a suspended sentence and set them free. But Malcolm Little, not yet 21, and Malcolm Jarvis were given up to 10 years in prison. We were not hardened criminals. We didn't feel that we deserved that kind of time as first offenders. So we were given that time mostly because of our associating with white girls. It was very difficult for Malcolm not to be put in jail and not to get trouble in with the law because of the context of the world in which he was living. And it was in prison that his life was transformed. In jail, Malcolm made a pact with Jarvis that they would learn everything they could and not come out, in Jarvis's words, as stupid and dumb as we went in. Life in like nothing they had ever known. 
the cell you lived in was six by 12. You had a, a, a hard cot to lay on, one table, one small stool, a bucket of water, no running water, and a bucket for defecation. It was unsanitary, unclean, and filthy. So with years of time on their hands, the two friends sat, studied, and read long into the night until their eyes burned. Malcolm educated himself, skills as a debater and speaker. While he was in prison, Malcolm's brothers, Win Filbert, had become members of the Nation of Islam, a small black separatist movement in Detroit led Elijah Muhammad, a one follower of Marcus Garvey. Malcolm's brother to convert saying they'd found religion, a way of life that survival. Malcolm resisted, then he relented. His life was transformed. He saw Christianity as the white man's religion, as the religion of black people who wanted to become like white people. But here in the black Muslim, the nation of Islam, he encountered a religion that reinforced his identity as a black person and enabled himself to love himself as a black person. He didn't have a particular love for white people. And they used to call him Satan at one time because they thought he was evil. A lot of the white inmates especially used to call him that. In 1952, after six and a half years in prison, Malcolm Little was released on parole wearing a $10 suit. He moved to Michigan to be with his older brother Wilfred. In Detroit, he would once again transform him. After six and a half years in prison, Malcolm was released in August 1952. He went to Detroit where his brother Wilfred found him a construction job. He joined the Nation of Islam's mosque. He worked hard to gain acceptance, to earn his ex, his new name for his new life as a black Muslim, to replace the slave name imposed on his forefathers. Malcolm soon went to Chicago, the headquarters of the Jamaat, became Malcolm X. His religious was complete. It is an about faith a complete turnaround, a, a new life in which Malcolm, who was the criminal, now becomes a minister in the religion of Islam. When uh, Malcolm came out of prison, the Nation of Islam was a, uh, a quite isolated little sect of about 400 souls. He would tell Muhammad, uh, you've got to bring this message to a much larger audience. So he became a recruiter one who went out and fished, as he said, for others to become a part of Islam. The Negro will be serving notice that no longer does he been turning the other cheek and being the constant victim of someone else's brutality. Elijah Muhammad was clear. The nation of Islam did not need white people or white society. Black self-esteem came first and with it, the establishment of a separate country inside the United States for blacks alone. Failing that, blacks should be allowed to return to their African homeland. We are African, and we happen to be in America. We're not American. We are people who formerly were Africans who were kidnapped and brought to America. Our forefathers weren't the pilgrims. We didn't land on Plymouth Rock. The rock was landed on us. The message was always, this is a racist society. White folks are not going to res rescue you. Forget about the civil rights movement. Forget about the civil rights legislation. You will never get real freedom and recognition between black and white people in this country without destroying the country. Without it was a message that terrified white America and was too extreme for most black Americans who saw the more moderate civil rights movement growing. In 1954, in Brown versus the Board, the Supreme Court said public schools must be integrated. In 1955, Rosa Parks started the Montgomery bus boycott by refusing to move to the back of the bus. 
Martin Luther King Jr., 26, began his rise as a leader in the push toward integration. The Negro citizens of Montgomery, Alabama, will return to the buses on a non-segregated basis. Meanwhile, the Nation of Islam struggled to win converts. Malcolm became the chief evangelist for the Nation of Islam, and he would go from city to city with great success. As a reward, Elijah appointed Malcolm head of Temple 7 in New York, and he became national representative for the Nation of Islam. And is regarded uh, very highly as the number two person in the nation of Islam. And, and it will be being regarded as the number two person that will eventually lead to all kinds of jealousy within the movement. Elijah regarded Malcolm as a son and told him he should marry for the good of the movement. In January 1958, at age 32, Malcolm wed Betty Saunders, who had gone to college and was planning to become a nurse. They moved to a small house in East Elmhurst, Queens, owned by the Nation of Islam. In November of that year, Atala, the first of their six daughters, was born. Malcolm was a caring father, a good husband, but he was almost never home. His missionary work and message came first. Blacks have been deprived for hundreds of years. It's time to take a stand. In the areas of the country where the government has proven itself unable and, uh, or unwilling, to defend the Negroes when they are being brutally and unjustly attacked, then the Negroes themselves should take whatever steps necessary to defend themselves. Because of Malcolm's efforts and his personal charisma, the movement was growing fast. Malcolm was very easy to grab hold to because Malcolm was John Wayne. Malcolm was all the things in the movie that we saw about our heroes. Our heroes didn't take nothing from nobody, and they always had the best lines. Tall, lean, handsome, uh, magnetic, a brilliant smile, a uh, dazzling smile. Malcolm was everywhere. He debated on college campuses, made speeches on street corners, appeared on radio and television. The more Malcolm saw of America, the more his philosophy began to change. For Elijah Muhammad, the movement was strictly religious. Allah would be the one that would punish the white. Malcolm, however, did not want to wait on God. It was the start of the rift between Malcolm and the Nation of Islam. But there was something on the horizon that would widen the split further. Malcolm discovered that Elijah might have fathered as many as eight illegitimate children. He thought if the story got out, it could seriously hurt the movement. He called fellow ministers he trusted to warn them of the danger. All three of the people he told immediately blew the whistle on him, called uh, headquarters in Chicago and said, uh, Malcolm is blaspheming against the messenger. He was the object of a lot of jealousy, so I think those people were motivated partly by jealousy. One of them was uh, Louis Arcon. Malcolm's finding out that Elijah Muhammad was actually the biggest hypocrite of all was quite devastating to him. It took the very foundation upon which he was standing out from under his feet. His access to Elijah became limited. He was rarely quoted in Muhammad Speaks, the newspaper he created. But despite his problems, Malcolm continued preaching the gospel of the Nation of Islam. Give us a chance to solve our own problem uh, among ourselves on some land of our own instead of continually trying to force us into white society where the white society knows we're absolutely not wanted. Now, Malcolm did not see how you could get freedom for African Americans by trying to be like white people. He did not see that whites would ever accept us fully as human beings. So for him, he didn't see why it is that the civil rights movement fought so hard to be integrated 
at the lunch counter for a cup of coffee because he felt that a cup of coffee was a small price to pay for 250 years of slavery. As the civil rights movement gained momentum, the nation of Islam remained on the sidelines, unyielding in its dreams of separatism. Though Malcolm kept his religious faith, he was moving further toward political activism and inevitably toward a greater confrontation with Elijah Muhammad. Though Malcolm's differences with the Nation of Islam were widening, it was not apparent to outsiders. He was as uncompromising and faithful as ever. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad says that the only solution for the problem is that our people, of which there are now 22 million, be uh, involved in mass exodus back to our own homeland. Despite adhering to the party line, Malcolm became increasingly isolated from Elijah Muhammad and his inner circle. The assassination of President John F. on November 22, 1963, gave the Nation of Islam a way to limit Malcolm's growing influence. Not want anybody talk the On December 1st. Malcolm gave a standard speech, but in an unusual departure, his case is coming home was a he handed his enemies sword. Elijah Muhammad knew this his best weapon against Malcolm. He said for three months. In in 1904, Malcolm had a secret meeting with Elijah in Phoenix and learned he had no chance for reinstatement. His ideas for the Nation of Islam had become too threatening to Elijah Muhammad's power structure. They didn't want Malcolm to succeed Elijah Muhammad of the movement. And the best way to make sure that Malcolm was marginalized and expelled. And worse, Malcolm began to receive death threats by telephone, by letter, and on the street. In March 1964, after three months of silence and much soul searching, Malcolm quit the Nation of Islam to form his own organization, the Muslim Mosque Incorporated. He wants to join the civil rights movement to broaden its scope so as to make it uh, much more militant, infuse some militancy in it. Malcolm brought his new message everywhere with Washington. During a hearing on civil rights, he accidentally met Martin Luther King Jr. for the only time. The two men merely exchanged greetings. In April, Malcolm delivered a major speech defining his new activism. The ballot is as powerful as the bullet. At least they're both important. And if you don't use the ballot, you're going to have to use the bullet. The Nation of Islam, continuing its purge of Malcolm, filed a notice, ordered Betty and their daughters to vacate their home. Malcolm and his family did not leave. Soon afterwards, his sense of religious mission drew him to a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for a pilgrimage to Mecca. It was a journey that would fundamentally change him. I didn't see any racism. I didn't see any conflict between the people over there because of the colors of their skin or the differences in color of skin. Many in America wanted to believe that Malcolm had modified his extremist views. What most whites wanted Malcolm to say and to do was to act as if racism had been eliminated and therefore I lack all white people. And Malcolm could never say that. In 1964, Malcolm formed the Organization of Afro-American Unity, created to reach out to blacks throughout the world as an expression of brotherhood. Unlike the other leaders of Mexico, he was treated in Africa when he traveled around almost like he was the Secretary of State, you know, from, from, from uh, black folks in America to the rest of the world. But to the American government, Malcolm was seen as a revolutionary. Malcolm was a haunted man 
and a hunted man. Agents of the American government, both of the State Department and the CIA, were monitoring his movements around Africa. He gets home and the climate is tindery hot. Inflammatory articles against Malcolm appeared frequently in the Nation of Islam newspaper, Muhammad Speaks. The most notorious was one written by uh, Louis Farrakhan and Louis X, who had been a protege of Malcolm's. Malcolm himself described it uh, as, as a in December 1964 and into January 1965, the threat continued. There were even several attempts on his life, assumed by some to be inspired by the Nation of Islam. I said, if you think for one moment that these brothers are not going to try to take you out, you're mistaken. But he knew he was hunted, and he knew his days were numbered, I think. In the early morning hours of February 14, 1965, his home was firebombed and destroyed. Except for a lucky stroke of fate, he and his family, including quite small children, and his wife, who was pre pregnant with twins, would have died. I really think Malcolm didn't want to die. I mean, he knew he was going to be killed. I knew he was going to be killed. Malcolm and to his mission, making speeches in Detroit and New York. In the week following the firebombing, observers described him as being very tense. On Saturday, February, the day before he was to make a speech at the Audubon Ballroom in Harlem, he checked into the Hilton Hotel in Manhattan. I think he enjoyed the, uh, the luxuries. He used to kid about it. He, he'd say, now I know what white folks have been hiding for, uh, from us all these years. Despite his going into hiding, burning calls to his home and the hotel did not stop. Sunday morning, Malcolm phoned Dick Gregory in Chicago, wondering if he would be there for the speech. And Malcolm kind of sounded kind of sad, but Malcolm knew something was going to happen, you know. And then I said, I love you. And uh, I would have liked to say see you when I get back, but I knew better. Before the speech, Malcolm was making plans for a trip south later that week. I went backstage and I was talking to him. And I remember thinking for the first time that he really looked harried. He gets to the uh, lectern, does the traditional Muslim greeting. And I heard him say, assalamu alaikum. Somebody leaps up and says, nigger, get your hands out of my pockets. And then the next thing I heard was the shots. And when I heard the shots, I jumped up and I ran through the doors into the, to the main room and I... You know, and it's, it just, it sounds to me like literally hundreds of shots. The first blast killed him, riddled his chest. And I heard, you know, people screaming and, sh and getting knocked down, and I got knocked down on the floor. Two more guys come up, one with a Luger and one, I believe, with a 45. Uh, dead body. So I laid on the floor until I heard the shooting stop, then I jumped up and I ran down and I jumped on stage. And I saw him, you know laying there on stage, and someone had pulled his shirt open, and I saw the bullet holes in his body. At 39 years of age, on Sunday, February 21st, 1965, Malcolm X was assassinated by three men, all members of the Nation of Islam. He died for, for what he believed in. He believed uh, with his whole heart, soul, and mind in the struggle of Afro-Americans in this country. One week later, Thousands would attend Malcolm X's funeral in Harlem. People were stunned by his death. Black America had lost a powerful leader. Born into a life of struggle and uncertainty, Malcolm X lived as a hustler and pimp, then as a fighter for his people, and finally a man of God. But the controversy sparked by his death would ensure that Malcolm X would not easily be forgotten. Malcolm X was laid to rest in Harlem, New York, February 27, 1960. Without his, he remained uncompromising in his expectations.
in the name of my ancestors, Peace forever and always, and welcome to another edition of what we call the Realities Temple on Earth Internet Ministry. I am the Mighty One, known here on social media as Angel Snub Nup Seven, your brother and your friend, Talik Ibn Ra. Ah, wow. I want to welcome you to this late night edition spontaneous edition. I thank you so much for joining us this uh, this evening. It's been a while since we come together for a talk and I must apologize as I am very, uh, for a person who doesn't have to, to work every day, uh, the last few weeks I found myself very, very busy and I'm so tired if it was not for taking care of some business, I would have been able to come and talk to us earlier. But due to circumstances beyond my control, uh, that was impossible. And I wanted to, to do this talk on the day that is celebrated for the 98th uh, soul birthday or anniversary of this man, our brother Malcolm X. I'm very sure as we talk a little bit here, I will I will wake up, <clears throat> but I'm so tired. <clears throat> I'm so tired, so just excuse me. I need to get up to speed here. Before we continue, I would like to just give a minute, a moment of silence in remembrance of this brother, El Haj Malik Shabazz. That's what he wanted to be known as. We know him as Malcolm X. So let's just give that moment of silence. This 98th birth anniversary of, of our brother Malcolm Shabazz. I would first like to say on Facebook, because I really don't do a whole lot of uh, watching a lot of YouTube videos, but I do make a lot of comments on posts on Facebook. And there are thousands who have never known Malcolm X wasn't born, but they have decided to commemorate, celebrate, and remember this day, his birth, May 19th, 1925. It is a shame 
among us there are those who claim peace and love and joy and they have tried to destroy the legacy and have spewed hatred of this man even though he's gone they cannot keep this man's name out their mouth to save their life he's a threat even in death a hell of a man you got to be a hell of a man to be in your grave and those who didn't even know you want you dead you're already gone there are those who wasn't even born who want the man dead again because there's an element of hate how can you how can you hate for what what is your where is your hatred coming from because you gave this man nothing the only thing you did was use him they didn't give that man nothing there are those who take and use you and when you stop giving to them when you stop kissing their ass they have the nerve to hate you you ain't do nothing for them so there's a group of people the only thing that organization nation of islam done was take from this man it didn't give him nothing well we gave him wisdom and understanding that don't pay bills that don't buy shoes that don't create generational wealth and then the little chunk broken down ass house that you let him live in you burn him out of that after all what he done. So they asked me, and I'm accused of being a Malcolm X worshiper. I, we don't worship people here. I'm gonna stand up for this man because he needs and he earned being somebody standing up for him. You are living and attacking this man in the grave. Why can't somebody defend him? Pieces of trash. The man cannot even rest in peace. Bunch of pieces of trash trying to slander his name. I didn't even know who Malcolm X was. I was introduced to the teachings of Elijah Muhammad when I was a little boy. Nobody told me about this Malcolm X person. I didn't know who Louis Farrakhan was. The only one I knew about was Elijah Muhammad himself. I didn't know about Wallace Muhammad. I didn't know about his wife, Clara. I didn't know nothing except Elijah Muhammad, period. I didn't know anything about Malcolm X until the 1980s. And when I first learned of Malcolm X, it came from the, the mouth of a hateful Louis Farrakhan, calling him a hypocrite and a, and a manipulator and, and a deceiver, all kinds of stuff. And I was in his ranks. I was wearing a bow tie for Louis Farrakhan. But I'm not a zombie. I'm not a cult member. I think for myself. And I don't know who the hell you are. I did not follow Louis Farrakhan. Louis Farrakhan told us, I'm bringing back 
the original teachings of Elijah Muhammad. Will you help me? I said yes, because that's all I knew. I didn't know about Silas Muhammad. I didn't know about the Son of Man. I didn't know about these factions. And the people themselves wanted to see the return of the nation of Islam as it was when Malcolm was thriving and Elijah Muhammad was thriving prior to this falling out. If anything, you should want to forget that part of your history. You should want to forget it. Because Malcolm is gone. Elijah Muhammad is gone. When somebody asks you about it, you should simply say, that was a part of our history. We regret. We learn lessons from it. We move forward. But no, you got to, Malcolm was a traitor. And the reason why Malcolm is dead is so I can live because I'm better than Malcolm. That's what it was all about. People jealous of Malcolm even when he's gone. I'm better than Malcolm. Oh, you have people all over YouTube trying to slander because they want to be better. You not better. And nobody's going to be able to be better than Malcolm. You don't have what it takes. Folks saw the sincerity in Malcolm. Malcolm said or made a statement, I paraphrase something to the effect. He's not perfect, he can be wrong, but I'm wrong. I'm sincere in my wrong. I'm not trying to deceive nobody. I actually, I'm, I was wrong. I'm in error. So he understood, and we understand that Malcolm X is not perfect, but it was wrong. What the nation of Islam dumped him is wrong for what you pieces of trash, you garbage dumpsters. How you talk about this man? Because none of you, even the nation of Islam, none of you would face that man in a put in a in a position where you can debate him. You can't debate him because you're wrong. So that's why the decision was made, we better kill him. We're going to talk about that real quick. We're going to talk about that. Islam is justice. You're a damn lie. It's talk. People don't practice what they preach. It's talk. I've never seen so much hate for a man when you go to Facebook or YouTube, all these clowns, all these misfits. They wish they could be Malcolm. You suffer from poor character. You don't have no integrity. You have no honor. You can't be, you nothing close to Malcolm X. Your behavior shows you're nothing like a Malcolm X. Hate him for what? What did he do to you? Some of you suckers weren't even born. They're copying and they're listening to the hate mongers who talk about, I'm peaceful. There ain't nothing peaceful about your happy ass. Islam's supposed to be peace. There's nothing peaceful coming out their damn mouth. Louis Farrakhan spent at least, at least 10 years. I know because I lived it. I was there some of the way. At least 10 years. I know starting in the 80s because I didn't know anything about Malcolm. I think on my own. And I studied the situation. And I came to the conclusion that the nation of Islam was wrong. Elijah Muhammad is my Spiritual father. I love Elijah Muhammad. 
Elijah Muhammad taught me, stand on the truth regardless of consequence. So does that mean if Elijah Muhammad is wrong, that I don't stand, that he gets a pass, or does that mean for everybody? It means for everybody. Including Elijah Muhammad. The nation of Islam was wrong, point blank. That's the end, end of discussion. There's nobody here, just like in the case of Malcolm, you ain't gonna bring your happy ass here and try to, to debate me to try to justify what the nation of Islam done and you claim to be peace lovers. In fact, there's nothing peaceful about no religion, especially these Abrahamic religions. All of them have been promoted and spread by violence. There's nothing peaceful about them. The Bible and the Quran is filled with violence. There's nothing peaceful about it. What is God doing peaceful? God is killing people. God is telling you to hate your mama, separate from your father, all kinds of stuff like that. What's peaceful about it? What's loving about it? They always talk about Jesus' love. What is loving about the Bible? Well, the character Jesus, I cannot, I mean, the character Jesus, he ain't do nothing to nobody. But when you look at the Bible and the Quran itself, look how violent it is. There's nothing violent about it. We live in a nation supposed to be under God, under Christianity. What's peaceful about it? They are in, involved in a war on the sidelines. Usually they are involved in the war. The war between Ukraine. They are part of that violence. Giving weapons away. Violence. The peace-loving Americans. The money and the time that you're spending on destruction, it wouldn't even, you're costing you millions of dollars. It would be much less trying to find a peaceful solution, but you're dealing with warmongers. And you're dealing with children that don't compromise their position because they're children. Silly people. We keep talking about the elders. Joe Biden, without a doubt, is an elder. With the mind, still have the mind of a child. It's my way or no way. You don't let him play basketball and it's his basketball. Well, I guess we won't be playing basketball. That's how these world leaders operate. Regardless whether it's Africa or Asia, anywhere in the world, in a patriarchal civilization, that's how they operate. Childish. Childish people. All this hate mongering about Malcolm X, childish ass people, jealous of a dead man. And then they talk about their success and show their work. Well, if your works and your success is so great, what the hell are you complaining about and talking about a dead man for? Because it's not. You don't even come close. You don't touch Malcolm's pinky. Full of hate. Why do they hate Malcolm? Let's talk about it. Sister Betty, his wife, may she also rest in peace. Sister Betty, in front of Louis Farrakhan, he didn't say a damn thing. Sister Betty said, 
that when Malcolm joined the Nation of Islam, it was like four temples, an old folks home. The majority of people was, you know, old folks that, that was from the 1930s, 40s, or whatever. There's a bunch of old folks home. They wasn't doing too much of anything. Had four, four temples going on. And basically, it was Detroit and Chicago. Didn't mention the other two temples, but basically it was Detroit and, and Chicago. And as you know, Malcolm joined the, the nation in Detroit. Said that right there in the documentary, didn't get no help from the nation of Islam. He got help from his brothers who had joined the nation of Islam. And then he got brainwashed and joined later on. Wasn't nothing going on with the nation of Islam. Had a few hundred people when Far Muhammad, the, the, the leader, was here. Under Elijah Muhammad, really nothing was going on. Nobody didn't give a damn about no nation of Islam prior to Malcolm X. Had a little, had a little uh, uh, press when Ford was here. Why did they get the press? They got the press basically because under Ford, the original teachings under Master Farad Muhammad, they practice human sacrifice. Do your research or just pick up one of uh, Omar Shabazz film because he, he 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 shows the, the, the information. The original teachings of the nation of Islam under four, they practice human sacrifice. And one of the members killed another member doing this human sacrifice crap. That's what caused the problems of, of Allah's temple of Islam, which that's the original name. Allah's temple of Islam got caught up in that murder and Master Farah Muhammad had a criminal background and simply what they told him, look, because that's one of his followers and they practice in human sacrifice. They, look, they said, look, the local uh, police department is like, hey, look, you got to get out of town or you're going to go to jail. Matter of fact, the crazy house, that's where your ass going. And Farah Muhammad's got the hell out of town. And so, we really don't know if he left Allah's temple because there's no record really, uh, to my knowledge, there's no record that he really left Elijah Muhammad in charge. But that's a story, that's a story to itself. But what we do know is that Elijah Muhammad changed the name to the Nation of Islam. And he changed some of the teachings and made Fart Muhammad God in person. That's not the original teachings. That's not the original teachings. That's what Elijah Muhammad brought as part of his Nation of Islam. And Fort Muhammad is not around to say yes or no. So Malcolm joined the nursing home of Islam, because that's what it was. And Farrakhan didn't say a damn thing when Sister Betty said that's basically what it was, damn nursing home. He didn't say nothing, so it must be true. As it was stated in the documentary that we watched prior to uh, my coming on the live stream, Malcolm was impressed by all this stuff. And he wanted to be accepted. And so he began 
the work. And I just, see, I can relate to Malcolm because that's the way I was. I wanted everybody to know about Nation of Islam. I couldn't sleep. I want to tell people about the Nation of Islam. I want to tell people about Minister Farrakhan rebuilding all this. I'm going to dangerous places. One, two in the morning. Cabrini Green Housing Project. I was told one of the most dangerous places to be in the daytime, let alone at night. Walking the streets of Harlem, one, two, three in the morning. I'm telling people about Allah. I'm telling people about the honor of Elijah Muhammad. I know how Malcolm felt. Didn't care about nothing else except drawing people to this something that I feel is good for us, good for me. So Malcolm began to put in 12 years. And when Malcolm got finished, Elijah Muhammad made him national representative. The jealousy began to start. The envy, like y'all still do today, and the man gone. The man gone, and you're still jealous and envy of, of the man. Michael put in that 12 years. When Ford was here, He only drew, the only reason why Far Muhammad was able to draw the people that he did, this was the 1930s. And people, even, even uh, Marcus Garvey, the reason why they was, our people was attracted to these people, these folks, because here you are, we just came off the slave plantation. Matter of fact, in, in the 1930s, there was people still alive who actually was on the slave plantation a few years ago. Still alive in the 1930s. Because of the racism, the oppression of this country, here you are, you had Marcus Garvey, here you had Nova Jali, here you had Elijah Muhammad, Nation of Islam, you had all these folks telling us that we kings and queens and how God is going to destroy the white man, that's, that attracted us to, to that. We want that. The same way that we are attracted to Jesus, we don't get our, our heaven in the afterlife and, and all like that, selling us hopes and dreams and promises and all these different things. It's, it's no different, same stuff. You're you're incredible because you're you're black and you you the, the you are the original man. How the hell are you the original man? And see, we take these things on face value. How the hell are you the original man when we know that the white folks raped us for hundreds of years? So how the hell are you gonna be original? You ain't original no more. But we accept these teachings. And Malcolm accepts these teachers on face value because it sound good. We love, we love things that sound good. A lot of you women out there, a lot of you women out there, you got babies because that man, he sound good. I mean, physically, he might look good too. You understand? But he put that, that rap on you. He sound good. But the reality sits in when you get that baby and then you don't see him no more. Or you taking care of his ass. Why are you playing video games all day? We got bills to pay. Oh, I got it. Oh, don't worry about it, sugar. Bam, you look good. <laughs> go, go get me a beer. 
We love things that sound good. And it gets us in trouble all the time. We stay in trouble because we like stuff that sound good, look good. Damn, that gal show sure got a big booty on her, man. Woo, look at them, look at them breasts. Woo. I'm going to get some of that because that look good. And then she might even sound cute. Ooh, and she even sound cute, too. Woo, just got me tangling, boy. I'm going to tear that, I'm going to tear that, woo. You don't know she got AIDS. You don't know she got syphilis. And you so mesmerized by the big booty and the big breasts is, and she smiled cute. Now you got AIDS and syphilis. Because you didn't take the time to really examine nothing. And Malcolm got caught up in it too. See, Malcolm is not perfect. He got caught up in some bull doo doo. It don't make any difference how intelligent you are. Because clearly Malcolm is intelligent. There are many people caught up in all this religious, spiritual bull doo doo, and they are intelligent. But it sounds, it sounds good. That's the trap. Speaking of trap, y'all ever heard of the Venus flytrap? And the Venus flytrap produces this sugar. And it attracts the insects. And the fly and any other bug come because they want, they want something that's sweet. Smell good. And so when they go in to get the sugar, get something that's sweet, then the Venus fly trap slowly shuts and trap them. And they can't get out. This is religion. This is spirituality. This is these pro-black pan-African ideology. They give you sugar. They give you something sweet. And you get caught up in the trap. Malcolm got caught up in the trap. I got caught up in the trap. The only thing that saved me I've always been a self-thinker. I always question stuff. That's the only thing that saved me. Otherwise, I would probably still be with Farrakhan. Clapping my hands, talking about, oh, minister, when you go on the mother plane, come back and get us. Dumb stuff. Selling false promises. Giving you something sweet. You get... You catch more bees with honey than with vinegar. What you gonna do with the bee? You gonna catch the bee so you can make a slave out of it. That's why. You wanna become a fisher of men. They love to use this analogy. Being a fish of men, what you gonna do? What do you do when you fish? You take a worm, you take whatever bait that you choose, something sweet, throw it in the water. There's a hook in in the bait. You're not trying to feed the fish. You want to get the fish out of the water so you can eat it. You trick the fish for your own benefit. That's what the church do. That's what Islam do. That's what these churches and religions and ideologies, that's what they do. They, they fish for you. And they got a hook to get you so they can eat and suck your blood. 
give you something sweet. See, we don't offer nothing sweet here. So the fish pass us by. So the fish pass us by. We're not, we're not selling false promises. We're not making something sound good, look good. We're not doing that here. <laughs> Trying to sound good, look good. We're not doing that here. These people putting on a show because they're not here. They're here to suck your blood. They're not here to mean any good to you. So, so Malcolm does 12 years. And this creates jealousy because it's 12 years of success. He's steady building. He's steady building the nation of Islam. Steady building. There's jealousy and envy not only coming from, see, because look, Michael came in, it was a nursing home. Why couldn't y'all do anything? So give the man his credit. Malcolm X put the nation of Islam, put it on a level that Ford and Elijah Muhammad together could not do. Because basically, the original followers of the nation of Islam were literate people. They were some of our our Worst people, uh, the criminals, drug addicts, and people of that nature. That's who the original uh, believers in the nation of Islam was. When Malcolm's got done, Malcolm attracted intellectuals, scholars, teachers, other preachers, historians, all, all people from everywhere was, was attracted because, see, look, it don't make any difference. What We love Michael Jackson, the Jackson Five. And we know that Michael Jackson is very talented. Michael and the Jacksons is nothing without Motown, Michael and the Jacksons, and Motown is nothing without promotion. Somebody got to go out and promote, let you know that you exist. They got to promote. Malcolm X was the promoter. He took those teachings and packaged it in a manner where it was acceptable to the people. He became the face of the nation of Islam. And whether you like it or not, y'all pieces of trash, you cannot talk about the nation of Islam and you don't talk about Malcolm X because he's the one that put it on the map. And everybody that come behind Malcolm, including Farrakhan, all of them based their scholarship, how they carry themselves on the example of, of Malcolm, who was the national representative. He was the face of the nation of Islam. He also was the, the, the captain. He was also the one that influenced the, 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 the FOI and how the men related in the nation of Islam. And all of them, because they never was on this level before, so you have to do things a little bit different because we, we have lots of folks here. And he was the face, he was the representative of the nation of Islam. Elijah Muhammad said, or called Malcolm, my son. And a lot of folks did not like that.
Even Elijah Muhammad's children didn't like that. Malcolm catching heat. Malcolm is not paying no attention because the only thing Malcolm is doing is doing the work what he enjoys. Just like in the documentary we just saw, Malcolm didn't even really want to get married. He wasn't interested in no woman like that. I just want to do the work. Elijah Muhammad encouraged them, got to find a sister because you're the national representative. You need, we, got, we got to maintain this look. He didn't care about getting married. He didn't care about that stuff. So he got married. But he wasn't interested. But according to what I saw on the movie Malcolm X by Spike Lee, Sister Betty was trying to get him the heads up. Hey, there's a lot of jealous folks. These people are not your friend. You got a lot of folks in here that they don't, they don't like you like that. Not because you did anything wrong, because they want to be you. Now, here I am, Angel Snuff Number 7, and I catch a lot of heat. I haven't done nothing to nobody. The problem is, they wish they could be like me. I ain't done none of these damn people. You wish you could be as strong as me. You wish you had our creativity. I would express our uniqueness. You got to copy people. You got to be an Arab. You got to be some foreigner, whatever. We develop it ourselves. You wish you could do that. So they express their hatred on us because we want to be who we are and not copy some sucker from some land we never been before. They really jealous. They jealous of Operation Exodus Mississippi. They don't even want to hear it. They're so silly. They don't even want to hear it because they know that what they've had for the last 90, 100 years has had a little success. We know that. We give you credit for that. But you, it has not caused us to win. You have had 100 damn years. How the hell are you going to argue with me? There's no make no sense for you to argue with me. You got 90 years, 90, 100 years under your belt. We had a pan-African, pan-African nationalist brother, whatever. I, I told him, you already had 100 years. We looking for another, like damn. How much time you need? That's not acceptable. But they eating sugar. Being so false dreams and hopes. That's why they hold on. Like damn. So you, they talk about the Christians waiting on Jesus Christ. They doing the same damn thing. Pretty soon, it'll be 2,000 years. Uh, well, uh, Marcus Garvey this and Minister Fad kind of. 2,000 years from now, doing the same thing. Waiting. How, so how the hell can you make mockery of those waiting on Jesus when your ass doing the same? You already... Been waiting a hundred years. You're no damn different. So it all came down to make a move on Malcolm. It all came down to a chicken come home to roost. We don't need to really get into a whole lot of history because a lot of us we already know this. We already know. We've 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 heard it over and over and over. It's a redundant ass story. So what's the sense to keep going over the same story over and over? We all you know the we know the story. Chicken come home to roost. Malcolm should not obey, disobey Elijah Muhammad's order. Reports now is that Malcolm never knew about it. He never knew about the order. But he's going to get punished anyway. He wasn't told. 
But anyway, it doesn't make any sense because how can you get upset about the, the assassination of President Kennedy and your doctrine is the white man's the devil? And you telling people that America is going to be destroyed. Now, you can, you can say that the white man is the devil and you can say America is going to be destroyed. Oh, loudy, loudy. Let's not talk about the, the assassination of President Kennedy. Loudy, loudy. Oh, the President Kennedy. Which is worse, the white man is the devil and my whole country is, 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 is being destroyed. Don't you think that's worse? Then the assassination of President Kennedy, where you said, well, you know, black people love uh, 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 Kennedy also. They also love Lincoln. They love a whole lot of folks. And your ass was still saying, still talking about it. You still were saying that the white man's the devil and all that. That was just an excuse. Just like some people right now who may be listening to our broadcast, they waiting on me to say something so they can use it against me. That's all that was. They used that against Malcolm to justify sitting him down. And probably because that's what the white supremacists, that's what the white folks that was giving Elijah Muhammad money wanted Elijah Muhammad to, 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 to do something about, about his boy. He getting out of control because Malcolm, just like the documentary, Malcolm was looking at things outside of religious teachings. You got to do something with that guy. This Malcolm guy you got. Malcolm, see, when you're caught up in a cult, when you're brainwashed, you don't see things clear. In 1959, Elijah Muhammad was sick. Malcolm basically was in charge of Savior's Day, 1959. I believe that was 1959. They invited some white supremacists to Savior's Day. And those guys said some foul stuff. In fact, it was so foul and people didn't understand why Elijah Muhammad allowed these Peckerwoods to come talk. They, they called black people monkeys and other stuff. Save his day. Now, if you notice, the FOI didn't get upset and try to kill nobody. And they at your meeting call you a monkey in your face. Call the black race monkeys, apes or whatever. They let them get away with that. But now we know that Nation of Islam was taking money from those type of people from, what's the name, JLJB Hunt or whatever his damn name is. The Nation of Islam was taking money from these kind of people. We know that. Elijah Muhammad don't care if he lose a few followers. These people giving him big time money. And Malcolm knew some of it. He had an idea something was going down, but when you are when you are a cult member, when you're brainwashed, you look over stuff. That was the first clue. That should have been the first clue to Malcolm that something is wrong. Then the next time, in 1962, when those brothers got killed in California, and Malcolm wanted to take revenge, Elijah Muhammad talked about settle down and all that kind of crap and made him look stupid because Malcolm been saying, we don't turn the other cheek, but that's what they did. Let Allah handle it. And when it's all said and done, all these people have the nerve to talk about Dr. King and, and, and nonviolent protests. What did they do violent? But they have a problem with Dr. King and nonviolent protest. What did they do violent? They didn't do nothing. Even to this day. You see these news reports. 
these pro blackity black pan Africans, whatever, they get pulled over by the police. They have guns. They don't. They don't fire a shot. They they know what to do. They lay their happy ass on the ground. That's what they do. And talk about what did I do? What did I do? You know, they, they, my rights being violated. That's what you see these moors on on these videos all the time. I, my 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 Moorish rights. I, I I got legal rights in America under Moors law. All this old chump stuff. A bunch of cowards. And they the ones talking about Dr. King. Who's more non non violent than the Pan African? Pro, what did Marcus Garvey do violent? When did any of these people attack the, the Ku Klux Klan? Never. Even to this day. So, of course, Malcolm X is not perfect because clearly Malcolm X was, a, was, was brainwashed. Clearly Malcolm X was a puppet. He was all caught up in that stuff. But one thing is clear. They don't want to give Malcolm X credit for putting the Nation of Islam on the map because he was able to do what, what God and Elijah couldn't do. And then they brag about Farrakhan. Farrakhan comes after Malcolm. Malcolm laid the way. Malcolm already opened the doors. Farrakhan ain't opened up no damn doors. Malcolm already opened up the doors. Malcolm started from scratch. Farrakhan didn't start from scratch. The role was already made. So you can't even compare him to Malcolm. And I want to say this in, in my conclusion. The nation of Islam teaches freedom, justice, and equality. Which is a lie. Because Malcolm should have had a trial. Malcolm should have been able to go before the believers and defend himself against any allegations that somebody make. They deny him that opportunity. You know why? Because they would have found out that everything that was being said is true. There's a lot of celebrities who would rather pay Michael Jackson, for example, in 1993. There's a lot of celebrities who would rather pay millions of dollars to avoid a trial because in a trial, a lot of things are going to be revealed. A lot of things are going to be exposed that probably don't have nothing to do with, with whatever the allegations is. So I don't want folks to know my business like that. So I'm not going to do that. Elijah Muhammad is not going to put Malcolm X on trial because Malcolm has a, a right to defend himself. And they would have found out that everything Malcolm said, and we know that everything that Malcolm said is true. It came out of the mouth of the son, Wallace. That's how Malcolm found out. But see, the thing about it is, if you do it right, what you worried about somebody telling your domestic life? If you do it right. Exactly. If you do it right, Who cares if why are you hiding?
out of your domestic life for? You hiding it because you teaching one thing and doing something else. That's the problem. I don't give a damn. You can marry a monkey if you want to. But if you're teaching against bestiality, but in your domestic private life, you messing with a monkey, that's a problem. Because you're not practicing what you're preaching. You're teaching monogamy, but yet and still, you're doing something else behind somebody else's back. And Elijah Muhammad teach against polygamy. The nation of Islam teach against polygamy. That's why they quote from the Quran and the Arabs. Because it's permitted there. But nation of Islam teaches against polygamy. He was an adulterer. There was a brother who kept going back and forth with me about the age of uh, some of these sisters. And he found out. See, because y'all don't do your own research. You go by what Wesley Muhammad say. You go by what Farrakhan say. You go by this brother decided to do his own research because it's all public record. It's all public record now. He found out, I think the sister name was Ola or something like that. She was 15 years old. Having babies by this old man. And look. This man, what, 60 some years old or whatever? Messing with 20. These young girls, he's 40 years older. What, what the hell, y'all? Y'all crazy as hell. Damn right, it's a cult. It's a cult. And these children are supposed to be special. What have they done special? This is 2023. What have these children, they're grown men and women now, what have they done special? Absolutely nothing. Nothing. When you're wrong, you're wrong. I love Elijah Muhammad, but he taught me to stand on truth, and you're wrong, sir. Nation of Islam is wrong. Farrakhan, Wesley Muhammad, all you suckers that's slandering back him, bringing up these damn lies. He didn't do nothing wrong. He did exactly what he was taught. You're supposed to protect the black woman. Lift up the black woman. Elijah Muhammad was not doing that. He was exploiting the black woman. Taking advantage of them because they idolize him. These young women. Like, just like any other preacher. Any other pork chop eating preacher. Quack. And you ain't no damn different. The nation of Islam became corrupt. That's the bottom line. And it's still damn corrupt. They just gave Louis Farrakhan 90, 90 ounces of gold. What you giving him a gift for? You already giving that man money. Every, then you are trying to raise extra for him. That's cult behavior. To, to do what? What is he doing for you? Not a damn thing. It's crazy. Then Wallace Muhammad is the one that told Malcolm because Malcolm didn't know. You didn't threaten him because that's Elijah Muhammad's son. We don't take it all out on, on Malcolm because we don't like him anyway. We're jealous and envious of him anyway. That's what it was all about. Nation of Islam teachings, and even before it even got to that point, Nation of Islam teachings and Quran teaching, they teach against slander, envy, and jealousy, and all those type of things. So believers shouldn't even be listening to that stuff. But they was. When a brother come with slander with, to you, you're supposed to report it. Hey, 
So and so was saying this about Malcolm. Hey, so and so was saying this about Farrakhan. You supposed to tell. They was eating it up. Nothing has changed. They're still doing it. There's people who probably jealous of Wesley Muhammad, jealous of Brother Ben. Matter of fact, it's my belief that that, that somebody in the nation of Islam got his original uh, YouTube page taken down because they want to get him out the way so they can raise up Rizza Islam. Because Rizza Islam fits fits the purpose more so than Brother Ben. I believe that his own, somebody in the nation of Islam done that. Because I believe his page got taken down because of copyright infringement. The only people that can take your your stuff down is you, the nation of Islam. Muslim not supposed to kill Muslim, and y'all celebrating this and feeding off of this. What kind of people are you? You ought to see how nasty they are to me. And I tell them, I thought you have supreme wisdom. I thought you supposed to be represent peace. There's nothing peaceful. There's nothing, no, there's no supreme wisdom about them. Bunch of a criminal organization. That's what Malcolm called it. That was the behavior. So they want to put on. They want to put on this front. Now, there are sincere people in the nation of Islam. But there are a lot of people who are wacky and they still wacky. Nothing has changed. I'm going to defend this man, Malcolm X, because he deserved to be defended. I'm going to defend him when y'all happy ass leave the man alone. I'll be happy to shut up. Let that man rest in peace. But you can't do that because you want to show that you better than Malcolm but you ain't did nothing close to what Malcolm was able to do. Nothing. Malcolm has an excuse. He's gone. You are lying. And when they, when they talk about, about their, their accomplishments, it's always about the past. This is what we did in 1930. This is what we did in 1940. This is what we did in 1950. This is what we did to me and man. Oh, that's old past crap. What the hell your ass did last year? Brother Talib, what the hell did they do last year? No, not a damn thing. They ain't do nothing last year. What the hell did last. you do? What the hell did you do the year before then? I was locked up for 10 years from 1997 to 2007. What did y'all ass do? I was locked up. I couldn't do nothing if I wanted to. They ain't do nothing. They was converting back to Christianity called Scientology. <laughs> no, that old crazy stuff. <laughs> I'm gonna take this question. I'm gonna take. I'm gonna give the mic to you, brother Talib. Uh, History reveals said, "What's your thoughts on the ones that supposedly ended Malcolm being exonerated?" I don't understand the question. What's your thoughts on the ones that supposedly ended Malcolm being exonerated? I don't understand the question. Could you clarify the question? I don't understand the question. But that's, I wanted to, I was tired. I know once I get to talking, I wake up. Uh, I was telling the audience earlier, brother, to live, you know, I'm going Going through some changes, and I hope it's changes uh, for the better. Man, I've been working so hard. I'm, I'm tired as a mug, 
and I don't even have a job. I'm like, I'll be glad when this is over with, you know, going through a transitioning period here. But, uh, oh, he said, those convicted of killing. Oh, what are your thoughts on the ones convicted of killing? Uh, I think that's a good thing, but it's way too late because one of the brothers is, is, is gone. They knew them brothers was innocent when they did that to them. And the Nation of Islam sat back in the, in the cut and let them brothers take the, take the heat. They knew them men didn't have nothing to do with that. They promised those men, we got you. We're going to get you these lawyers, and we got, we're going to take care of your family. They didn't do a damn thing. One of the brothers, I saw an interview with him, and woo, he was just so angry because they lied to him. Because he said they, they, he thought they was going to have his back. The Nation of Islam didn't even, didn't even send them brothers a, a pack of ramen noodles. That's how pitiful. You know, see, the, the thing about a cult, the thing about these organizations, once they cannot use you, they're not interested in you no more. Once they cannot use you. That's how it is with, with these people. They don't give a damn. Look, if I'm your brother, whether I'm in the nation of Islam or out of the nation of Islam, I'm your brother. That is, that's not how they do. That's not how they do things. Once you leave the nation of Islam, they don't want their members talking to you no more. They, they, they don't want you, they're associating with you no more. So that means your brother, that means your brotherhood was fake to begin with all the time anyway. It wasn't real. I'm your brother as long as I'm part of your organization. As long as I'm giving Farrakhan 90 ounces of gold. It was fake anyway. But see, for me, the difference between me and Malcolm is I've always been able to think for myself. Malcolm got caught up in that, in that crap and he was hooked and he was hooked good. And it's my belief. This is my belief. I don't know. It's my belief that Malcolm wanted to die. That he didn't, he, he made it where, made it easy for them to kill him because he was tired of it all. It reminds me of uh, what they call that uh, suicide by cop. Put yourself in position because you know those cops will kill you. That's what Malcolm did. When he didn't have security like that, he made it easy for them. And they took advantage of it. That's what happened. Somebody was describing Malcolm, saying he was just wore out. I mean, you got people that's trying to kill you every day, 24 hours a day. How can you sleep? Everywhere you go, you got to look over your back, whatever. He just got tired of it. Then his family is in danger. So Malcolm just, like, I let him kill me and, you know, uh, and be done with it. But that's not even enough for these suckers. It's not even enough for them. They still messing with the man. This is 2023. That's 1965. They still messing with the man. Like, damn. Like I said earlier, you a bad mama jamma when you dead and, and, and these folks still, still, you still bother them. I'm going to turn the mic over to our brother, Talib. Yeah, yes, thanks for allowing me on the panel, brother. I just got off of work. I'm tired myself, as you could see. Yeah. When I was outside, that's where I yeah. was coming from. Uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, I'm going to take a silent second moment to honor the ancestor El Hajj Malik Shabazz, a.k.a. Malcolm X, who was born here in Nebraska on May 19th of this day in 1925. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, 
as I as I look at what's going on now with the message that he left us and the work that he left for us to do, it's a damn shame that so many of us that claim to represent or honor him ain't even willing to try the Mississippi campaign. Yeah. You know. They not willing to do nothing in his honor to help liberate us as a people. And it's a damn shame. I'm talking about people that know. I ain't talking about people that don't know. I'm talking about people that know. No. And so, you know, it's like I'm at the point right now where this is why I took a sabbatical from black YouTube and social media because they're not, you know, um, you know, and shout outs to you, Mella Cap, and uh, the rest of the game and the deacons of uh, reality. But uh, yeah. It's like, uh, you know, it, it saddens me, man, because it's like that video I sent you earlier. I, I hopefully you got it on your uh, text. Mm -hmm. uh, his brother was talking about the uh, racial war that's going on here in the United States right now in 2023, you know, and. He came up with, you know, because I'm not done watching it, but he so far he came up with nothing but facts dealing with this. And I and I thought about it when I sent you the post video to your, you know, and I, I, I said, you know what? This is why the Mississippi campaign is urgent. Mm -hmm. And Brother Malcolm. Would, would 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 be rejoicing right now if he seen that come off the ground. Mm -hmm. Not just him, but our ancestors. But since this is in his memory, I'm going to say again, that brother would have rejoiced to see the Mississippi campaign come off the ground. Mm -hmm. He would have rejoiced because he would have said, well, at least my work is halfway completed. You know what I'm saying? He would have said mission accomplished because that's what he was about. He was about trying to liberate us. He was about trying to free us. Mm -hmm. He wasn't about trying to enslave us by way of religion. You know, he wasn't trying to force religion on us. Even when he was in the nation of Islam, if you listen to how the brother talked, he wasn't trying to force Master Farah Muhammad on people. Mm -hmm. Go back and look at some of his old clippings when he was in the nation, before he became El Hajj Malik Shabazz. He was not trying to force no belief system or religion on anyone. And see, that's why the nation of Islam hated him. Mm. Because he was trying to push revolution for real. Mm -hmm. Although he was doing it from the nation of Islam's platform, but they were they, they was not accepting that because all they thing was about was money. Mm. Like it still is today. Right. That's all it was about is money. You know, and, 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 and uh, I tell you, you know, uh, I hate 
you know, and I understand that the nation of Islam is programmed. Those in the nation is programmed to think the way they think towards that brother, towards brother Malcolm. But the disdain, Vaz, the disrespect is very unnecessary. Okay, you don't agree with him. You don't agree with the stance he took far as his post-nation Islam transition. You see what I'm saying? But why you got to keep calling a man out of his name? You know? And I'm, and, I, and, and I'm calling them out. I'm talking about cats like Eric Muhammad mm -hmm. and other cats like him in the nation. You know, calling that man all out his name. You forgot he the one that carried the nation of Islam. Whether you want to accept the truth or not, he carried the nation of Islam. If it wasn't for Malcolm, the nation of Islam wouldn't have got the popularity it did. Period. Matter of fact, the nation of Islam will be almost defunct defunct known like the Moor Science Temple is mm -hmm. that came before them. You don't see nobody around the world other than not the name of the Moor Science Temple of America or their leader, Nobu Ali, do you? Well, if it wasn't a Malcolm, the nation of Islam will be in the exact same position. It'll be a fa it'll be a fade away of the past, which nobody wouldn't hardly hear about. But because of Malcolm X, the world know who the nation of Islam is. You even got followers of the nation of Islam living in other countries around the world converted to ne to the nation Islam because of Malcolm X. Whether it's Canada, the UK, the Caribbean islands, even I think over in uh, Africa somewhere like Ghana, I believe, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. You know, even down in Latin America, you you know you have followers of the honorable lot of of Elijah Muhammad. You know what I'm saying? So you know that was because of the work of Malcolm. It wasn't because of the work of Farrakhan. It wasn't because of the work of Silas Muhammad. It wasn't because of the work of these other wanna be uh, successors of Elijah Muhammad or or, or the number one. Sp a uh, voice for Elijah Muhammad as Eric Muhammad claimed he is it was because of Malcolm X Eric Muhammad wouldn't be able to have a platform he has even whether it's on YouTube or Facebook if it wasn't for Malcolm X mm -hmm. United Muhammad's United Temples based out of San Antonio, Texas, would not have a platform they have if it wasn't for Malcolm. Even Marvin Muhammad, the son, a.k.a. son of man, wouldn't have his platform set up if it wasn't for Malcolm X. None of them. But yet, Oh, by the way, Elijah Muhammad wouldn't have been known like he is now if it wasn't for Malcolm X. I told you Elijah Muhammad would have just been the fade in memory lane like Noble Drew Ali. Yeah. Who he studied up under mm -hmm. before he became Elijah Muhammad. Okay. So, 
you know, like I said, you know, at least get that brother his props on that note. Beside the disagreements you have with him, dead or alive, give him his props on that note. You know, because, you know, all this other crazy stuff going on in the world right now with us as a people, we should be heeding to his fight for liberation struggle. He talked about a younger generation that will come alive. And you know who that generation is today? This generation. I'm talking about this generation that that that's uh behind, I mean that's 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 uh past me and Talik's generation. Because mm -hmm. I want to go into that a little bit. Like I saw off this video today when his brother was speaking about it, you know. You know, it, it's become a time now where our youth and our younger brothers and sisters, especially like in their early 20s and, 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 and younger, you know, they not giving a care. See, it was a time, like this brother was saying, where blacks wasn't killing white people because they knew they was going to get more time for killing a white person as opposed to them getting less time for killing another black person. And, and like the brother pointed out, they not caring about that. They going in, they going in the suburbs chasing after them uh, Caucasians, killing them, or wherever they could find them. They have no complete, they have no, no, no type of kind of, uh, you know, discretion. Even though if we could reach out to them and get them the right type of insight to go about things differently, they'll be even more dangerous, but in a positive way. But these these young brothers and sisters is not it is a total is a different whole different gener generation from what all of our the rest of our generations was. Because they not scared of slave master like that. You know, even though they still kill me and you, but now they turning them guns over and pointing it in the direction of the white folks. And I'm not saying this to be, you know, boastful about that because it's sad that they got to go that route just to be heard, you know, even why they think they trying to stand for something. Right. You know, but it's a different spirit with this generation. And if we got together as older adults. Who are their parents and grandparents. Or, or uncles or grand uncles. Grand aunties. You know what I'm saying? Grandmamas, granddaddies, you know. If we got together and, and put them in a position by taking control of a state, they could they could really take us to the next level as a, as a people. I mean, as a group of people. They could take us to the next level as a group of people. Because they, I mean, <laughs> these young brothers and sisters out here is not playing. 
And, and like I said, Malcolm X prophetically spoke of the younger generation. Now, I don't know if he had a premonition when he spoke about it. But obviously, he must have felt some type of way where he saw the coming of a different type of young generation that wasn't happening. And today in 2023, me as their elder looking at them, you know, and I'm not trying to sound religious when I say this, but hey, I guess this generation is the type of generation that Brother Malcolm was talking about because they ain't playing. They not playing no games. And we should put them in a position to where they could really be flexible and leading us to complete liberation for once and for all from this over 400 year travesty that we've been going through as a people in this country. But that young generation is nothing to play with. I'm telling you, you know, they, they just, they just, they just need right direction. They just need complete right direction. You know, they need the right direction. They need to be steered in the right direction. And of course the nation of Islam is not doing it. The Moor Science Temple is not doing it successfully. The new Black Panther Party is not doing it. The new Wabians is not doing it. The Hebrews is not doing it. You know, none of these groups out here is really doing it by leading them or steering them in the right direction or where they need to go. Because, uh, I mean, you know, <clears throat> it, it saddens me Because personally and generally, had I been there to be more of a better example, it's like most of all of us should, should have been around my age. This young generation would definitely be a power force to be reckoned with. And see, you know, this is why these white folks, you know, uh, 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 you, you know, coming out with these guns, committing these mass shootings, trying to kill off as many of us as they can, because they fear that one day it could possibly be a retribution from black people for all the stuff that these Caucasians have done to us for the last 400 some years. You see what I'm saying? So, and, and, who, and who do they fear? It's not us old folks. Huh. We ain't nothing to them. It's them young ones. These young ones right now running out here doing what they doing, the wretched stuff they doing and all that, them the ones they worried about. And like I said before, they don't give a damn if they do get more time for killing the white person. They don't care nothing about that. They do not care. That's the mode they in. They ain't got no filter. And how they how they doing what they doing. And my generation, the generation me and Tali come from, didn't have that type of heart when it came to dealing with these Caucasians. You know? <laughs> so I know, <laughs> man, look.
<laughs> and, and, and as a matter of fact, the brother even pointed out where these young soul black brothers out here with these guns then even got to the point where they rather not even point them at the Mexicans. They rather just point, it, point them straight at the Caucasian. <laughs> That's deep. You know what I'm saying? Because those of us who know the history between blacks and Hispanics in this country know that it's always been opposing conflicts throughout time between us and them. But uh, they didn't got to the point they not even pointing the guns at them. They're pointing the guns at the white folks. It's happening all over the United States right now. Oh, you got, you know. Oh, right now, in 2023, matter of fact, it's been quite a lot of bloodshed behind that. And we we ain't what? We ain't even uh, finished ha with the half of the year 2023. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, man, I tell you, uh, you, 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 you know, uh, we better better wake up. We got a young generation out here that's willing to fight, that's willing to take this, even if they got to take it to the death. They willing to take this all away. If we steer them in the right direction, give them the right tools to go about this before they destroy themselves. We don't want to see our young brothers and sisters destroy themselves like that, but we got to give them the right tools. We got to, in other words, we got to give them the answers. And the one answer is we got to take control of a state to put them in that position to where we could really work with them and give them the right tools. Because without no right proper guidance, of course, they're going to destroy themselves. Mm -hmm. But I've never seen no generation like this. I'll be 55 soon. And I've never seen no generation like this. Not before mine or. And like I said. Be, before minds or past minds, because we got to remember, you skip past those born at least in the 80s and 90s, you know what I'm saying? Those are the ones that are their parents, you see what I'm saying? But, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, like I said, man, uh, young brothers and sisters out here, man, Whew. And, and I say it's almost hard not to be afraid of them because of how so destructive they are. <laughs> I mean, for real, you know what I'm saying? These, these, man, I have never seen no generation like this. You know, and, 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 and I'm like, man, brother Talik, have you ever seen a generation like this, brother? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I've heard that. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm just saying, man, <laughs> I've never. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be quite honest with you. I've heard that 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 rhetoric for years and years. You know, yeah. yeah. If you listen to Louis Farrakhan, he said the same thing. Oh, this generation is, is dangerous, and they're not going to take it the, the way we, you know, we did it in the older people and the blah. blah right, blah, blah. right, right. 
Yeah, I've heard that. Uh, oh, whatever. All this time. Uh, look. Okay. This this is the bottom line. Just because you idiot don't make you brave. I mean, they just out here doing yeah, idiot, yeah, idiot, idiot, idiot stuff. Yeah, you know that. You know. It, so, I mean, what's, what's spectacular about that? What makes them... That, that's that? why I say we got to put them in the right, the, right, the right frame of mind because we know that's destructive. Exactly, but we're not, you know... In order to put them in the right frame of mind, they have to be in the right environment. We're not willing... And we got to take control of a state. Yeah, we're not willing to put them, put yeah. them in, the, in the right environment so that that energy that they have... Yeah. They can go in all directions. They can go in the direction where we're building and, and maintaining something, but also at the same time, uh, don't mess with me because I'm going to come at you hard. Yeah, see, we. this is what I'm trying to, that's my whole exact point, is what I'm saying is, is that we need to put them in a the position where they could translate that energy from that negative stuff into the positive route where they could build and where they could establish a situation that future generations could come behind them and never know what it is to be a slave or the N word. <laughs> See, our, our problem is these these other these, these folks out here, uh, pro blackness, pan Africanism, religion stuff, all that stuff, all that's divisive. Right. Exactly. 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 It's all the divisive. So. You know, these children don't know what to do because this side is saying one thing, this one over here saying that. They And, you know, younger people, even older people, like, yeah, I don't want nothing to do. I'm just going to live my life, you know, smoke my weed, live my life, and then die. They're not even interested in our struggle really like that no more. They're not even interested. You know, look, listen, listen to the conversation. I mean, these videos... <laughs> About this subject matter, about our struggle, it should get millions of views. They they don't. They're not the people not really interested in like that. I understand right. to a certain point why they're not interested like that is because we're a bunch of damn, damn losers. Mm -hmm. You know, we we've never won. We've never really, we've really never won a real battle. I mean, we we we've done a you know we we we've had some. A, a little success over the years or whatever, but we never had no, no, we never really won no real battle. Every time we put our faith in somebody, you know, something happens and, and it all falls apart. And mm -hmm. it reminds me of a child, or well, actually, I can use ants. I can use mm -hmm. ants for an example. You know, when I was a little mm -hmm. boy, I see these ants build a, build a mound. Mm -hmm. And then I, as soon as they get it built, I'll come back and kick, kick it, kick it down, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they'll build it back up, and I'll come back and knock it back down. Mm -hmm. pretty, soon, pretty soon, ants will stop building the mound. Because, you know, they get, tired, they get tired of building, building the mound up. And that's mm -hmm. what they do. We keep getting built up. And then and then get knocked back down. There's only so much of that we're gonna take. Mm -hmm. you know, because a lot of folks put a lot of investment in, in, in our people. We, we have a lot of belief in our in our people, and then we it, it all fails. And folks are, are tired of that. And right now they're they're materialistic. The main thing you hear them say all the time, I'm getting paid. I get no thing on their mind now. I, I you know. Get, get this dollar. I gotta get this dollar bill, baby. You know, they take pictures of the white man's money on, on Instagram, Facebook. You know, I gotta get paid. I gotta get my money. And they, they go out and buy material things, gold, diamonds, and you know, put decorate themselves with all this bull crap. They gotta buy big houses. You know, that's what that's what's on everybody's mind, you know, material thing. Because they wanna try to be like the oppressor. You'll never be like them. Mm -hmm. These people own these people own nuclear power plants. Look, we all need electricity. How many electric companies do we own? Electric companies make trillions of dollars. I ain't talking about no millions. Electric companies make trillions of dollars. Oil companies. We don't own no oil company. We don't own no electric company. We don't own no 
no no power plants, nothing like that. You know, we best we could do is a few million. We might be able to do a bit, you know, a couple of billion, or whatever, and, and entertainment or whatever. But we don't, we not, we're not like that. We, you're trying to keep up with somebody, and you just came off the slave plantation. How the hell are you gonna keep up with somebody? They they own, they control all the resources. How the hell are you gonna catch up with them? You know how much land you gotta come. There's no land with resources that you can buy that can help you keep up with them. There's no land out there that that you that we can we can buy. You can't keep up with them like that. But that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to keep up with the Joneses. You can't keep up with these Joneses. These people was building and making money off of your of our ancestors' free labor and stuff. For over 200, 300 years, while we on the slave plantation, they got a 300, 400 year almost for head start on it. And then whatever you do get, they control it. They can take it away anytime they feel like because you can't defend a damn thing. You know, Beyonce and Jay-Z just bought this $200 million house. They could take it away from them today if they wanted to. It ain't really there. They can't because they don't control no law. They don't have no military or nothing to defend their house. They don't. They can be taken away from them easily. They can easily. They can easily uh, use the old. What, what, they don't have to use no excuse at all. But they can always use public domain. But they don't have to use no excuse at all. They can outright just say, "We want it. We taking your crap. We can freeze all your assets because all your money is in their banks. We don't have no banks or nothing. And if we did have banks, it's still intertwined with the stuff." So, you know, the Mississippi campaign is about the beginning of trying to get yourself out of that situation. That's what it's all about. And these folks actually have the nerve to be angry. How the hell are you going to be angry? Because they didn't come up with the idea because they don't know how. But you've been getting support for over 100 years. Nation Islam been around for 90, over 90 years. More science have been around for uh, 100 years. That Pan-African stuff been Y'all been around. You got you have thousands of members. You get lots millions, of millions, millions under Marcus Garvey. Yeah, you, you, you had millions under Marcus Garvey, at least two million they said. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, 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 see, and the thing about it is one man gets deported and all of it falls apart. What do mm -hmm. they have to say about it? If Joe Biden died today, do you think America's gonna fall apart? George Washington died. This nation didn't fall apart. Kept on rolling, kept on rolling, kept on rolling. Our leaders die and everything fall to hell. There's, there's a problem. There's something wrong. There's something wrong. And so we need to figure what, what is wrong and fix it. We're not fixing anything. We're doing the same redundant stuff over and over again and expecting a different result. Mm -hmm. You're not the complaint is look, you you've been if we play basketball, I even seen this with Michael Jordan. If Michael Jordan is not putting up the point points, I've seen him take Michael Jordan out of the game. <laughs> we don't need you, you you mess and get you gonna have to sit you down. Mm -hmm. These people want to stay in the game and not making no points. They don't want to give the people on the bench a chance to, to, to try to shoot the ball. They're a bunch of ball mm. hogs. they a ball hog. You're not making the... That's why they keep talking about what I used to do. What the Nation of Islam did. This. That's what you used to do. What are you doing now? You're not doing those things no more. And the reality is, even when you was doing it back in the day, it really, you know, it's over, over exaggerated. It really wouldn't... Uh, because the Nation of Islam, most of their businesses... Was 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 in the in the in the red. They wasn't they wasn't making no profit. Elijah Muhammad was using a lot of his money that he was getting for his personal use, putting it back in those businesses to try to you know to try to make it look like they doing something. They was they was in the in the red. And then Elijah Muhammad died, and all of it fall apart. They blame Wallace Muhammad. No, you blame you. You blame the people. You have to. We, we love to, 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 to put blame on other, oh, the black woman did this. What about you? You act like black men is perfect. We got a lot, black men have a lot of problems. 
That's why I said deal with yourself first. And I guarantee you, black men deal with themselves first. Watch the sisters. They are automatically come behind you and get themselves together right behind you. How the hell can I tell you don't smoke and drink? And I'm smoking and drinking both. We smoking and drinking together. We got, I got to work on me in order to, to talk, to tell you anything. I got to tell you, say, look, to live, I don't smoke and drink no more. You know, hey, hey man, you know, why don't you try this? Why don't you try that? Well, you know, you know, hey, I don't do no, I, I like to smoke. I, I, I've been doing this for 30, 40 years. But at least, <laughs> but at least I'm an example showing you, showing you better, which might inspire you to do better. <clears throat> But I can't inspire you to do better. I'm not doing no better. How the hell a black man gonna tell a black woman what to say and what to do? And you, 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 you hell fire. And we scared to we scared to talk to other men to get them straightened up. Look, brothers, we gonna have to straighten up for real. Like myself, I don't allow men to come around me cheating on their wife and their girlfriend. I don't do that. Don't talk to me about that. That's your wife. That's your girlfriend that you claim that you love. You got children by them. Be faithful to her. Don't come around me bragging and tell me about I got this B on the side. Don't bring that to me. We tolerate that type of talk. Like Elijah Muhammad, he's the Mr. Leader. They should not have tolerated this. They should have been on his case. Uh, you married to Sister Clara. Why are you messing with these young girls? They should have, they should have let that happen. So you brought these problems, and now your happy ass, all of it was destroyed. If you if you lived up and practiced what you preach, you might be stronger, Malcolm might still be alive, and you might really be doing something in 2023. We love to blame other people for, and we don't want to hold ourselves accountable for nothing. Well, you know, the brother, the white man do this and the that. We love doing, like, damn. It's 2023. It's redundant. It gets, that gets old. Hey, could I say say this, brother? Um, uh, you know, the young, young younger generation ain't even looking at it like that no more. They like, we don't give a damn what color you is. We taking whatever we got to take. You know, we getting it how we live. You know, this is their mentality. So, it's 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 like. We got to put them in a position to trans to transcend from that. Yeah. Now those of you that say, now those of you that say it's about the you, like Farrakhan and all these other cats have been saying mm -hmm. for years. Yeah. Well, damn, how come you ain't? Uh, put it in help put it put a stop to them killings in Chicago where your headquarters at exactly all them young black brothers and sisters they're dying every day <laughs> the, the murder capital of the world and you can't even you can't even <laughs> you you your headquarters is right there but you talking about trying to liberate all of black America you can't even liberate them Negroes in Chicago <laughs> Not I mean, they killing each other wholesale over there. <laughs> Babies too. Anybody in the way, get in the way, can get it. <laughs> Y'all ain't even intervening in no type of way. You know what I'm saying? You know, that's just, you know, I, 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 that's why I say because of that is why I've taken a different approach, especially since I've been on this Mississippi campaign, you know, that all that black conscious stuff, like you say, and all that, need to completely just go out the window. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, let's deal with, with creating more laws to benefit us. You see what I'm saying? Mm hmm You know, and, 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 and let's utilize the laws that's supposed to help us to, to create them laws. You see what I'm saying? 
We ain't even doing that. We're not even using the civil rights movement as a base to help us create laws for ourselves that would be uh, conducive for our condition. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. We ain't, we, oh, man, them, 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 them laws ain't. No, if you if you use them laws the right way, instead of getting out there marching and protesting and go straight to the law and deal with the law aspect of it, we could get some serious change. Martin Luther King did that for us. We ain't got to do that. He laid the blue the blueprint out. All we got to do is establish laws that are directly in favor of us. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And that got to be respected even by the races. And one way we put ourselves in that position is take control of a state. What's so hard about that? Huh. All them folks, all them uh, black folks in Mississippi, what's so hard about that? You see what I'm saying? What, what is so hard about that? You know? Y'all know, but like somebody say, y'all just want to be comfortable, mm -hmm. as you call it, in the belly of the beast. Mm -hmm. You want to be comfortable. I was hearing Eric Muhammad the. <laughs> <laughs> of the weekend talking about uh, the debt ceiling and how America, the economy going to crack. Negro, y'all ain't prepared for that. What is you talking about that for? Y'all ain't prepared for that. Exactly. Because soon as that economy crash, what you going to do with them dollars you making off of YouTube and Facebook? Oh. And donations. What is Farrakhan going to do with that money he got off of donations? We all going to be in the same boat. So who, wh where, where is you? What, 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 um, you know, terms of solution do you have other than that rhetoric? Because if that dollar crash, we all done. Yeah. <laughs> it's just that simple. <laughs> you know, and people and people and see with the way that the that the politics is going and that the world politics and the economic system is going, we can be headed in that direction. Republicans and Democrats can't agree on the debt ceiling. They just walked out of, out of you, you know, out of a meeting today in the U.S. Capitol. The Republicans did uh -huh. because they couldn't agree with the White House on some concern in the debt ceiling, which makes it more possible that by June the first, they could default on their debt. Oh. The United States and, and the United States is in a bad position because we still owe China billions of dollars. So I mean, no, no, we owe them trillions of dollars. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? So I, I, I mean, it's like, man, what? Are, are you serious? You think this can't happen? You know, I understand everybody got their own opinions and stuff and how to, how they look at that either way. But, you know, <laughs> man, uh, <laughs> that ain't a good thing. You talking about 300 some mad million people in this country, more guns than the population of this country. Exactly. Bruh, <laughs> look here. <laughs> We talking about some real serious stuff. So yeah. Yeah. Nation Islam, just know that you're going to be in the mix. All that 
symbolic stuff you talking about where Allah's going to send angels to guide where y'all go and this and that. The believers go. Uh, uh, <clears throat> check this out. <laughs> They wasn't there for them brothers that got killed in Los Angeles in 1962. Mm -hmm. They wasn't there uh, for this one brother in the 60s in Louisiana. You, you know, that, 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 that was being oppressed by the police because of them te believing in them teachings. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. they, wasn't, they wasn't there for other members of the Nation of Islam. Even them brothers that y'all didn't, uh, you know, help exonerate before they had to do all that time over Malcolm's killing. You see what I'm saying? So, uh, man, miss me with that. And then let, let them tell it it was part of the prophecy. It was supposed to happen like that. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, really? It was supposed to happen. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, you know, that, that, see that and, and all the other pro-black organizations like that, when they take a fall, that's the first thing they say. Or oh, where well, it wasn't time. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 you, you know, uh, it was part of the prophecy, you know. Yeah, yeah, we know. Yeah, 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 whatever. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I tell you what, see, if the, if the U.S. default on his death, check this out. Who the first ones they gonna hurt? Who is gonna hurt the worst? Look at yourself in the mirror, so black man and woman. Mm -hmm. We already know. That's why they got these immigrants here, trying to push black people out of Chicago and other cities. They got a plan for us. And a plan, a separate plan for them. You see? So, I mean, it's like, man, you know what? Uh, and then this Negro, Eric Muhammad, screaming about <laughs> some 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 civil rights leaders letting them uh, go ahead giving them to the go ahead that it's all right to build a cop city in Atlanta. First of all, if if the nation Islam had things so much under control, it shouldn't even have to be at that point. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And you trying to reach out to civil rights leaders in Atlanta, knowing they ain't going to listen to you. They wasn't trying to listen to you back in the 60s. Even when Malcolm and Elijah was around. You see what I'm saying? What make, what make you think they're going to listen to you now in 2023? You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know, so, <laughs> man, <laughs> you know, it's like this. Whatever happens to us at this point going forward is all on us. It's not on the white man. It's not on nobody else. It's on us. It is on us. We already see the writing on the wall or even all the black politicians that don't give a damn about us. We see the writing on the walls. We to we stand up and fight, or we just get exterminated. That's all that is. <laughs> you know, I, I was looking at a thing where they was having, a, where the people were speaking out about them immigrants trying to, you know, come into their community in Chicago, and they was demanding the city of Chicago uh, that they didn't uh, want them immigrants in there and stuff. And, some of them who was trying to get up to the mic to speak, the voice, they uh concerns, they mic was cut off. Some of them people's mic mic was cut off. 
That's how much they don't respect us as black people. You see what I'm saying? Either do something about it, Negro, or sit your or sit your butt down. That's what they telling you in so many words. You see what I'm saying? So if you think that you gonna keep, if you keep thinking you gonna get justice out of a system that's not willing to really give you justice. And you and, and see, this is what many of us forget once again, is that we was uh, perhaps free from slavery by default. Exactly. Let me let me repeat it again. We were perhaps free from slavery by default. Because two sides, far as them Caucasians are concerned, could not agree on one simple thing. And that's what led to the Civil War. Lincoln in the South, in the Southern Caucasians could not agree on the issue about uh, extending uh, territory further west so that they could have more slave states. You see what I'm saying? Extensively. And so since they could not agree on that, well, we got the Civil War. If it wasn't for that, if Lincoln would have told them, look, y'all could keep y'all slaves. We just don't want you to, ex to extend your uh, empire further west mm -hmm. or the Mississippi. But you could keep your slaves had 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 they had they agreed on that one thing right there, it wouldn't have been no such thing as no civil war as we know it in the history of this country. And guess what? Who knows how many more hundreds of years we'd have been picking cotton and sugar cane? Hmm. I'm, I'm just saying. Mm -hmm. So, 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 you know, uh, <laughs> you got the, you, you, you know, man, check this out. <laughs> it, it, we were free perhaps by default and yet we still ain't a free people. Exactly. You know, and, and, and that's that's the thing about that. And, and so, you know, um, we got to understand and wake up and realize how serious this, this situation is and stop playing games. We're not free. As a matter of fact, under the right given circumstances, you want to talk about uh, the, the America fought, defaulting on this debt, debt they got. <laughs> you, listen, <laughs> man, if that happened, well, you know, they go to concentration camps. Which they already got set up all around the country. It'll be a repeat of Nazi Germany. As we know that. As far as that part of history is concerned in the world, you know. So, I mean, we need to stop just playing games. With ourselves. With our lives. With, the, with, with our future generations. And, and, and uh, you know. Get our head from between our two butt cheeks. <laughs> That's all I can say about that. You know, because.
because uh, this this is this is real. You know. I ain't putting all these black brothers and sisters in the penitentiary for nothing, merely just because they committed a crime. Everybody else commit just as much crime as we do, especially the Caucasians, since they the majority still in this country, you know, but yet we the most populated in all of America's prison systems. You see what I'm saying? We hold the majority of population of, of that of, of the prison system in this country. You see what I'm saying? That's that's by the sign, that's for a reason. It got that set up for a reason. And even if you do get out. And some 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 of these brothers and sisters cases, they can't ever get a job, period, working for a check, not even working, uh, mopping the floor at McDonald's. Because there's certain felonies, like I remember years ago, it was, a, it was that, that, that uh, you know, they just won't hire you because of. Like I remember a sister telling me years ago when I was still back home in Michigan. Uh, she was telling me that her brother did fed time. And now, you know, the feds is kind of different from the state. But that's a whole nother different conversation altogether in itself. But uh, she said her brother did fed time. And uh, said... The stipulations was when he got out, he could not work a job, not even at McDonald's. He couldn't work for a check, period. Not even picking up a cow doodle. He could not work for a check. Do you know how, how, how very debilitating that is? When the United States government tell you that you can no longer work legally making a living. Do you do you know how debilitating that is? So with it, with it, what is it left for you to do? To go back and do the same thing. So you could be in one of them prison slave camps again. If they don't kill you first, you see what I'm saying? So, I mean, this is a part of the situation when it comes to that uh, 13th Amendment, which tells you that slavery still exists in the United States. That's why I say Y'all getting caught up in that system, ain't nothing cool about that. Because we are always the main first ones targeted. And that's one way that they have been destroying us as individuals, well as as families and as communities, as we can see all over America. We ain't even got a community no more. And that is one of the reasons that mass incarceration thing is no joke. <laughs> Matter of fact, it's just as much as worse as crack itself. It's much as worse than crack cocaine. I mean, we just look at how, that, how it's actually destroyed us. You know, that was one of that was one of their first things. That's why they came out with that. Let's get tough on crime. Let's let's have a war on drugs. After they killed off Brother Malcolm and then Martin Luther King, that was their issue plan. They even pushed back the gains that was made through brothers like them, through, through sisters like them, you know? 
because they didn't want to leave no trace of our ancestors' struggle where we could latch on and carry on. And this is why we're in the worst condition that we're in now. Oh, and, and don't sit up and say, oh, well, we got black millionaires and billionaires. Look, that's a personal thing. The hell with that. That's a personal thing. That ain't got nothing to do initially with us as a group. That's a personal thing. And there's nothing wrong with having wealth. But at the same time, that's a personal thing. And like somebody said, we under a system, a racist system as well, they could just snatch that within the blink of an eye. And ain't nothing them celebrities with that type of money could do about it. Ain't nothing they could do. <laughs> and that's the reality of it. They could rig up some stuff in that system because, see, they the ones that control that system, the banking system and all the monetary stuff that comes with that economic system. They control that. So they could put any type of justification. And even if even if you try to take them to court about it, it ain't going to really do nothing. Because the courts is a part of that system. <laughs> you see? And they got much, way more money than all them celebrities put together. So who gonna win? You see? You see what type of situation we in? So, I mean, this is what's going on. This is real. We, I mean, you know, there is no, res no one respects us. And we haven't shown no effort to, to change that. And that's why they keep doing what they doing. So, I mean, you know, um, That's why I say the only thing I could do is keep trying to live for however long I could live. And then just uh, evaporate <laughs> from this existence. Because, hey, at this point, I mean, you know, if you're not going to live for real, true free, freedom and liberation, what is the purpose of living? You might as well just be comfortable with being a slave. Because that's all you is to them. You know, that's all the hell you is to them. You know, so, you know, you might as well just accept whatever you going to get. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You might as well just accept that. You might as well accept the, 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 uh, the consequences that comes along with that. The ramifications that comes along with that. You know, you might as well accept it and just be, you know, a comfortable slave. You know, and just accept whatever they bring, they bring you because all that tough talk that most of you do on social media, talking about banging on the beast. And I don't hear y'all even talking like that no more on YouTube. I guess they just shut y'all down after they threaten to take your YouTube accounts <laughs> down, <laughs> you know. 
and your 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 subscribers down and in your in your monetized channels i guess you i guess you went another route and say no nah, i don't want none of that uh heat coming my way because i got to keep making my money <laughs> you know man it's ridiculous how we even think today as a people it's very ridiculous we don't have no 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 type of you know creative mindset whatsoever or how to you know get out to dig ourselves up out of just a little small dirt hole you know you know we got all this uh want to be you know what i'm saying gangstified <laughs> uh mentality hard hitter mentality but when it come to actually demonstrating that against the right forces that's you know responsible for partly for what we're at <laughs> you you know you ain't gonna hear not even a, a pin drop coming from none of these same people with them type of mentalities you know, that's this why I just I just don't have no uh you know I I I really have nothing for for a lot of these people in this social media stuff. You know, I as a matter of fact, uh, I've even uh, stopped associating with a lot of them because I see this they, 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 with that the way of their thinking it's going nowhere it's taking us nowhere you know and uh, but other than that uh, far as brother Malcolm X uh, one day Cause I live here in the state where he was born in Nebraska. So one day when I get a chance, I'm gonna go over to Omaha, which is an hour away from me. And I'm gonna visit that community center they got named after them. Cause I'm pretty sure they had some type of celebration for him there. They always do annually whenever his, his birthday come up. So, you know, next year maybe but who knows, I may end up being a part of that, you know, because Malcolm X was one of my, uh, matter of fact, he was, yeah, he was one of my very first influences as far as freedom, liberation, struggle is concerned. He was one of my very first influences in life. Before I even heard of Elijah Muhammad, before I even heard of Farrakhan, mm -hmm. or Dr. Malachi Z. York, a Yahweh being Yahweh and all these other cats. You know, before I even, well, I, I, I heard of Marcus Garvey's name, but I wasn't privy to him at the time like I was of Malcolm X, you know. But uh, Malcolm X was my first, he was my first influence. And so I have to definitely give credence and acknowledge me to to him as the ancestor you know and um uh, I, I, I still even wonder today if he got family uh you know actual blood relatives that's still in omaha i'm pretty sure he possibly may have a couple of people that's still related to him there because they even got, I did find out also they got a street named after him in the same, uh, where, right where, where, where the house used to stand at where he was born in. So, uh, you know, but, uh, yeah, uh, 
yeah, one day I'm going to go to Omaha and uh, pay tribute to the brother, you know, pay homage, you know, because I, I haven't had a chance to get around to it, but I will eventually. And, and um, you know, um, I definitely, um, you know, it's sad because we don't got brothers like that around no more. You know, and, and it's it's sad, but we got to we got to get it together, fam. We got to, you know. And uh, before I get tongue tied, with that said, I'm gonna, uh, you know, rest this mic, or rather yield this mic back to our brother, the number one soul brother, Angel Snub Snub Seven. Take it away. All righty then. I just want to say this before we close this one out. I, I, of course, all respect and honor of uh, our brother Malcolm X, of which I believe, I don't know, I have to believe because he's gone. And I really don't know uh, what his mindset would be. Regardless, I think that he would be pleased with uh, this concept of, of Operation Exodus Mississippi campaign because it does contain a lot of the elements that he pointed out, especially in his uh, speech called The Ballad and the Bullet. Um, what I really, I expected, but people make these claims of supreme wisdom and all this knowledge and, and whatever, but they get they get real silly when they don't when they can't come up with nothing. Now, all these things that we talked about before, they've been around for almost a hundred years or whatever. And in fact, I actually was part of Farcon's organization for nine years. So when I speak about these things, I'm talking about from a personal experience, I'm also talking about from what I know, being in this, being in the Black Power movement. Well, actually, I don't call this. I call it's this really entertainment. They turned everything into entertainment, but it was more real when I was a little boy, you know, growing up. <clears throat> so I've been in this in this thing for over forty years. So I can talk about these things because I have actually have knowledge of them, been part of it. What's so silly about these people, many of these people that, that I deal with on, on, on uh, Facebook, they want to critique the Mississippi campaign. They don't want to talk about the Realities Temple and don't know nothing about me, don't know nothing about Realities Temple. They don't know nothing about Operation X the Mississippi campaign. If you're going to do that, if you want to critique something, then you should know about it. They think that I'm so simple or Mississippi campaign is so simple, they can just make up something and that's what it is. And they trip off words like soul because they don't really know what that's about. Even though we lived it. <coughs> we lived it. When, when they talked about soul power and black power, they went along hand in hand for a long time. They, they went together. Don Cornelius did not invent soul power. This was something that came from among us somehow. I don't know what the real origins is, but that's what we called each other. You can go and look at those old sitcoms from the 60s. Matter of fact, I was watching Good Times this morning, and uh, wasn't that sweet daddy was talking about, you, you know, you're a good soul brother. We was using those type of terms. We also use soul music. Those things are unique to us. There was a time when people wanted to be soul brothers and sisters. There was a time when we when we concentrated on our own uniqueness. Now, now we want to be Africans. Now we want to be Indians. Now we want to be the, we want to be these other people. When there was a time 
when everybody wanted to be like us. Now they just want to steal our talent. They really don't actually want to try to be like us. They just want to steal our, our talent. There, there was a time when brothers had swag. Everybody developed their own. We were unique as a people, but we also developed our own uniqueness. We wasn't running around trying to be clones of everybody. Now we're clones. You go to the Muhammad Mosque and say Muhammad, the whole temple turned around because all of them got the last name Muhammad. Like, damn, what is that? Some kind of factory? Some kind of cloning factory? What, what's up? There's no uniqueness to nobody. That's why when I created my name, Talik Ibn Ra, I wanted to be different from everybody. So when they say there's the Talik, but there's no Ibn Ra. That's totally me. So when somebody said, Mr. Ibn Ra, will you come to the desk? The only one who's going to turn around is me. I like that. I want to be unique. I want to be original. I don't want to be like everybody else. They want us to follow them, and they want to be people from the 5,000 years ago who they never seen before in their life. They want to copy Arab. They want to copy Nick. I don't want to copy those people. That's a belittling to me. That's an insult to my intelligence. What about our culture? Everybody on earth had started from somewhere. Culture is nothing but a lifestyle, the way you live. That's all culture is. And as time goes on, your culture would be 5,000 years old, 10,000 years old. That's all culture is. You should be happy to be able to start all over from scratch and develop new so your walk would be easier than theirs was. Why you want to be these people? Some of these people have a nasty background. They're involved in wars. Like, they are involved in wars and other atrocities. Why you want to be like them? So, they look so stupid trying to talk about reality's temple on earth when you don't know nothing about what it is at all. That's why they don't never quote nothing I say. Because you don't know nothing about what, what I'm about. You don't know at all. They don't quote nothing from the Mississippi campaign because they never studied. They never, if you're going to, this is why I was so disappointed with Guy Gay Nollywood Jr. Because when he made though made that video about Alquan, he took the time and actually went in and 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 recorded the things that Alquan actually said, so he can't argue with it or whatever. And it was it was a it, he did a good job researching. So I was expecting him to do the same thing with me. But the thing about about that is you. You're wasting your time. I'm not saying nothing. You might disagree. I'm not saying nothing that's out of the box. You can disagree all you want to. Matter of fact, they don't even really know why they disagree. They just don't like the fact that it's coming from Angel Snub Nub 7. If it came from Marcus Garvin, it would be acceptable. Firecon said it's acceptable. They want, they don't, it's not like they don't, they hate Angel Snub Nub 7 or the Mississippi campaign. They want it. They would like for me to be part of them. They would like for me to be part of the Mississippi campaign come from them. But it's not for you. You had your chance. Selfish ass folks. Try something new and support somebody. Give somebody else a chance. But we're selfish. We're so selfish and grandiose and you wonder why we're in the condition that we're in. It's unfortunate. Who knows where Malcolm could have took the nation of Islam? Who knows where Malcolm or what Malcolm could have done for the black soul community? Jealousy, envy, silly, you violent, profane, nasty, you're a hypocrite. You say one thing, but you do another. 
And you're always going to be a loser. And that's why I always talk about us being losers. And no matter how you pretend not to be a loser, it's quite obvious. There's no need to debate. Are you winning? No. You can pretend to be a winner, but you're not winning. When we start winning, I will give credit. When God help us, I will give God credit. I'm not going to give nobody, including myself, unearned credit and praise for doing nothing. Because it sounds good. Because it tastes sweet. Well, you keep falling for that trap. I would hope younger people would be more wise, but they're not. They're just acting out. Acting out without a plan. Acting out just flailing around. You just end up drowning. And you're still not going to go nowhere. And believe me, these people, if you really act out, these people got something for your ass. You're only going to act out to a certain point. Sit your happy ass down when they get sick of you. So on that note, thank you, everybody. Dickens Reality, Mellow Cap, everyone, for joining us. Those who are listening and those who will be listening to this program at a later time, those who are on our people on Facebook and Instagram, thank you so much. Like I always say, uh, I don't know yet how to look at all these platforms all at the same time, but I'm not uh, ignoring Facebook or Instagram. I appreciate you. Shout out to uh, all those who support this platform. And... Um, I just wanted to say something on the day that everyone else that we are, that we are celebrating this great man that deserved this recognition who was not perfect but he did not deserve how he was treated after all the good that he done that should not have happened and I hope maybe that we, we learn a, a, a lesson from all that so on that note, I want to thank you again. And uh, I'll probably be too tired tomorrow, but maybe I can deal with the subject that I had scheduled for tomorrow at 2.30. I'll probably do it Sunday because I know I'm going to be too tired <clears throat> probably tomorrow to come back and talk with us uh, on the scheduled video. I've been so busy. I just, I'm just so tired. I need a, I need a break. And uh, I probably I probably will do that that subject Sunday at two thirty. So I appreciate I appreciate your support, and uh, uh, <clears throat> if if the Holy Ghost hits me, you know we'll be talking more regular. You know, right now uh, I've been so busy, but that's that's slowing down. Trying to get back to normal, we'll be able to get back to our some of our normal talks. And uh, it's amazing how, even though this channel don't have uh, hundreds and hundreds of subscribers like my channel, the, uh, our main channel, I'm still getting the same amount of views. So Google, whoever y'all out there like to flag the channel, you don't stop no show. But I only get, I only get 10 subscribers anyway. I only get 10 views. So I'm happy with that. Other folks might not be happy. I'm happy with my... 10 subscribers, and my 10 views. It's all great. We out of here. And uh, I want to thank Brother Tal Talil for stopping by. And maybe he might want to talk Sunday with, with us too. Uh, we'll come back Sunday. And and, uh, and uh, like I say, try to get some regular, regular speech going. We out of here, y'all. 
as as our brother Dr. Nillis used to always say as a party, I wish us love, peace, good night, soul. Well, the five thousand.